Okay, Ricardo, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to, uh, to speak to us today remotely. We're very much looking forward to, we have a full house here in the, uh, in the auditorium. So please feel free to go ahead and, and make your presentation. Thank you very much for the, um, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pity that I cannot be there in person, but I'm very happy to deliver the lecture online. Uh, and, and thank you very much for, for the introduction as well. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, machine learning and, and fluid mechanics. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be focusing on turbulent flows. And uh, the title of my talk is Explaining and Controlling Turbulent Flows Through Deep Learning. Uh, and I'll get a bit more into what I mean with these two things. Um, my, my research is funded by, by the ERC, the European Research Council, uh, and also the Swedish Research Council. So let's uh, start with a little uh, summary of applications of machine learning to fluid mechanics that have been uh, successful over the years, starting perhaps with the earlier work by Milano and Kumosakos, where they basically modeled the near world region of turbulent channels with uh, neural networks uh, over 20 years ago. More recent, there has been quite some work on sampling scale modeling, development of inflow and boundary conditions, uh, possibilities for runs modeling, uh, PINs, physics in four neural networks, which are also helping a number of contexts where um, experimental data is also available, uh, and also applications to, to flow control. So it seems that uh, machine learning can help in a wide range of areas. Um, we have a recent uh, review paper uh, together with uh, Steve Branton where we highlight um, the possibilities where machine learning can help CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, this is published in Nature, Computational Science, and uh, we see a potential in the context of accelerating DNS, uh, being able to improve modeling, both in terms of uh, LES runs, uh, and also when it comes to improving uh, the development of review sort of models. Yeah? So there could be some uh, possibilities uh, for machine learning and CFD. And more recently, we have another uh, review paper. This one is with Steve and with Beverly McKeon uh, to appear in Nature Review Physics, where we look at um, machine learning and experiments. So we also um, highlight uh, that machine learning can help in the context of measurement techniques, uh, also for experimental design, uh, and in the context of flow estimation and uh, model predictive control. So this last aspect of the flow control and estimation, uh, that's something that I'm going to be touching upon today. So we've shown through different uh, studies that uh, there is potential for machine learning and fluid mechanics. Um, and today I'm going to be focusing on two different questions, two different areas. One is trying to use deep learning to understand something about turbulence. Uh, and we're gonna be using what is called explainable uh, AI or explainable deep learning. And in the second part, I'm gonna be using deep reinforcement learning for turbulence control. So we're gonna try to see how we can first learn something about the flow and second, try to control the flow. So let's start with uh, understanding turbulence through explainable AI. Uh, this is a, a turbulent channel. This is a low Reynolds number, a DNS. Uh, this is a Reynolds tau 125. So this is turbulent, but very low Reynolds number. Um, we are identifying the so-called Q events. These have been uh, studied by Jimenez group for quite some time. Uh, these are basically uh, three-dimensional regions that are satisfying this condition over here. So basically, you have the instantaneous Reynolds shear stress being larger than a certain threshold multiplied by the Rodman square fluctuations in U and B. So technically, three-dimensional regions of intense Reynolds shear stress. Uh, and of course, um, this, uh, as this is known from quadrant analysis, uh, are divided into four different types of events. You have strips, ejections, uh, and then outward and inner interactions. And uh, these uh, Q events are colored in this figure according to the type of um, element in the quadrant analysis that is dominant in these regions. Uh, so you can see that these blue regions, which are the ejections, are very important. Uh, and then the yellow ones, which are the sweeps, are very important as well. Okay. But right now, I use a word very important, which is perhaps a little bit uh, misleading, because uh, what do we mean with important? Is it because they're big? Is it because they are uh, helping the flow in some way? Um, and there's quite some uh, literature on trying to define this question of importance. We are um, in, interested in assessing what uh, structures in the flow are important, because if we're going to be controlling the flow, perhaps we should target those structures that are important, no? 
And again, I still haven't defined what we mean with importance, but that's going to be a, a central concept in this in this talk. So we're going to try to um, assess the question of importance with an X AI framework, explainable AI framework. So what we do is that we start with uh, following this um, chart that you see over here. We start with an initial flow field. This is a three-dimensional instantaneous flow field. We're going to be using a, a neural network to predict the flow in the future. Okay, so some time steps into the future. Um, when the flow is evolving, then the structures are changing. They can move, they can merge, they can dissipate. So some of them will be different. And um, that prediction is going to be conducted through a particular type of architecture, which is called a unit. I will tell you more about this architecture in a minute. Now, we have this neural network that is allowing us to advance the solution in time, let's say. Then we want to segment the input, so the initial flow field, using Q events. So in my input field, I'm going to identify the three-dimensional regions that are most important to make the prediction. And uh, in step number three, we're going to assess the importance of each structure using what is called the SHAP uh, framework. Right? So this is um, a game theoretic method. Uh, it's relying on sharply additive explanations. And the idea is that uh, this framework of deep learning explainability is removing elements of the input and then is recalculating the errors. So we take this big structure over here, we remove it, we recalculate the error, and then uh, we try to assess uh, what is the contribution of the error of each of these three-dimensional volumes in the, in the input uh, field. So in that sense, uh, we can try to assess the question of importance. Uh, so how am I predicting? No, this first step of prediction seems to be important. I need to have a deep learning architecture that is very good at uh, reproducing accurately the evolution of the flow that you would get with the governing equations uh, and using what is called a unit uh, with 3D convolutional layers. Uh, the input will be the three velocity components, U, V, and W, of the three-dimensional velocity field at the current step. The output will be, again, the three components in 3D velocity fields at a future time. Uh, in this work, we're considering a viscous time step of five, so basically five viscous uh, units into the future. And uh, the architecture that we're considering, uh, again, is, a, is based on convolutions, but it combines residual blocks with pooling. So what does this mean? Here is my input in the upper left corner, the three velocity components at instant ti. Uh, we apply several convolutions. Then I do a pooling. Yeah? So this is basically a max pooling. What this is doing is reduce the dimension of my uh, reduce the dimension of my of my data. So I'm reducing by picking the maximum value within a region. I'm reducing the dimension of my data. Uh, and then I do that once again. So I go to the third level down here. Now my fields are much smaller. So essentially my feature maps are simplified. I have fewer feature maps or perhaps in another way, I am having feature maps that are um, representing coarser elements than those in the input. I apply some convolutions going right. Then I upsample again to increase the dimension of my data, apply some convolutions, up sample again and end up with my output. Okay, so this unit has the shape of a U because I am applying convolutions, reducing resolution, convolutions again, and going back to the original resolution. This turns out to be a quite effective way to um, use uh, computer vision tools like convolutional neural networks uh, to exploit the feature maps in my data. So I can hierarchically build my coherent structures in the flow by combining the feature maps of different resolutions. And these green arrows over here uh, that you can see, this is uh, basically a skip connection where I am combining feature maps from the early layers with those of the deeper layers. That also helps to uh, enhance the compositional capabilities of the network to build the neural, uh, the neural network output, essentially. So uh, long story short, I have 2 million parameters to try to make those predictions. And this is an example of the performance that I can obtain. So essentially, I obtain around 2% error in the predictions of U, V, and W. 
fluctuations. This is a low enough or not low enough. That's something that uh, well, we're looking at. We're trying to see uh, how low of an error is acceptable to make this uh, study. Uh, in principle, 2% seems to be reasonable. Uh, and you can actually see, sorry about that, uh, if you go back to the previous slide, you can see uh, on the top the DNS. These are the string-wise velocity fluctuations at Y plus 12, so in the near world region. And the second row um, is basically the prediction. So actually, uh, well, visually, we see an excellent agreement with less than 2% error. So in principle, um, we can get a quite uh, good representation of the flow uh, with this uh, unit architecture. I want a good representation of the flow because now I'm going to be starting to remove features from my input and assessing the importance of those features in the output. So essentially, I have my flow field here. What I do is that I am uh, removing a Q structure, so a three-dimensional volume, and replacing that with zero fluctuations. Then I redo my predictions with the new uh, field where the structure is, loose, is missing, and my prediction is going to be changed, right? So I have my error when I have all my structures in my input, and now I start to remove structures, so my error is going to naturally increase. Um, and then what I want to do is compare the error when everything is in place with how the error is increasing when I'm removing things. And that's something that uh, is associated with the importance score, uh, which is given by this SHAP. And this SHAP value is the importance score. By the way, everything about this study is in a preprinting archive. This is work by Andres Kremaders and collaborators. So you can see all the details here. Uh, and the idea of the SHAP is to use this equation that you see over here. So I have a linear model of the error between the predicted and the true fields. And uh, these cues are binary variables that are representing whether a structure is present or not in the flow, basically. And these SHAP values are the importance score. So I'm going to apply a linear regression to fit these five coefficients such that the approximation of the error matches the real error. The error, the deviation between the CNN, the neural network prediction, and the truth. Uh, long story short, what I'm doing is evaluating the importance of each of these cues, which are the structures, the importance of each of those value, volumes to the prediction. And that's going to be given by these five values, by these sharp values over here. Okay. Now, this is a technique that is very well established in computer vision, and that's what we are trying to adapt now in the context of turbulent fields. Uh, what we find is the following. This is the distribution of the SHAP for all the structures that we see on the flow. Uh, these blue ones are the ejections. So 60% of the uh, structures are sweeps or ejections. So these are going to be very important. Um, we actually see that um, if we take into account the volume of the structures, we get a perhaps more uh, representative fraction of the SHAP. Remember, the SHAP is the importance of the structures in the flow. So per unit volume, around 65% of the importance is through uh, ejections and 32% through sweeps. I remind you that ejections are regions of flow with negative streamwise velocity and positive wall normal velocity. So they're going backwards and up. And the uh, sweeps are the opposite. The sweeps are the uh, are going to be Q4 events, so positive streamwise velocity and going down. Yeah? So the sweeps and the ejections are the dominant elements, which of course this is known from work on the turbulence, but now we can confirm the result with the deep learning analysis of the flow. Now we can correlate the sharp value, which is in the vertical axis. Uh, I would like to um, let you know that the sharp uh, should be uh, observed in absolute value. All the values are negative here because all the structures are contributing to reduce the error. That's why the sub value is negative. Uh, but of course, the most important structure would be the most negative in this figure. Uh, and there seems to be a positive correlation between the importance and the volume. So a priori, the most important regions of the flow are also the larger ones. But the picture, the picture changes when I normalize by volume. If I look at the importance per unit volume, and versus the volume of the structure, what I see is three different regions. Uh, this um, red region over here is the part of the figure where I have the most important structures per unit volume. And it turns out that they are very small things. They are 
essentially uh, attached uh, medium-sized ejections. Right? So they are ejections that are smaller. These are the most important ones per unit volume. This blue region is uh, made up of large ejections. So these are still very important and very large. And in this magenta region, I have a smaller sweeps and ejections. So basically, I have extractors which have a similar shaft per unit volume. Eh? So sweeps uh, and ejections are important. And turns out that there are a particular type of ejection that is quite small, and those are the most important per unit volume. I want to, uh, again, reiterate our message here is on how to judge importance, right? We're finding an objective way to define importance uh, in my flow. And when I'm reiterating the question of importance, uh, of course, uh, the question comes, well, Q events are associated with the Reynolds shear stress. So perhaps looking at the Reynolds shear stress would be enough, right? I mean, this three-dimensional volume, uh, looking at its contribution to the Reynolds shear stress might be enough to assess what is important and what is not. And if one plots the sharp values or the importance as a function of the Reynolds shear stress, that's the figure on the right, we clearly see a, a positive correlation. Eh? So the most important extractors also have more Reynolds shear stress, which again, is not a very surprising conclusion, but perhaps is still to corroborate. However, the uh, message changes when I normalize per unit volume. So the, the, the key also of the SHAP framework is it allows me to um, study elements per unit volume. What are the regions that are maybe small, but they have a very high density of importance in my flow. And then I see three different regions. In region A, the band, the correlation between importance and volume uh, is a bit lost because this band gets much wider. So there's a wide range of importances for a particular uh, Reynolds shear stress contribution. The B region uh, includes the extractors that are the most important from the perspective of the Reynolds shear stress. So if I invent that the most important extractors are the ones with most Reynolds shear stress, this B region will be the most important. But it turns out that uh, based on our criterion, the deep learning based importance score, the SHAP, gives me this region C. And this region C are mostly medium-sized ejections and some inward interactions. These are the ones that objectively are the most important in the flow. So not necessarily the ones with the highest Reynolds shear stress are the ones that are contributing the most to our flow, uh, which perhaps is uh, not fully surprising, but it's uh, allowing us to formulate this in a way that we can further the study uh, in the future. So everything that I showed so far was just about documenting the methodology. So a method to really identify which key regions are most important in the flow. But perhaps what we really want to do is not um, to segment the flow using a predefined criterion and see which of those extractors are more important, but to really look at a flow and that the flow um, with a machine learning algorithm, we can find the three-dimensional regions that are most important. So not uh, doing the segmentation first, but obtain the segmentation as a result of the machine learning. And that's what we are currently working on. Um, what we will do with this analysis is apply the SHAP framework to each grid point in the domain. So I will use for each of the grid points in the domain, uh, basically the kernel SHAP, um, kernel SHAP and the deep SHAP, so a more efficient way of implementing the, the SHAP analysis. And then I will lump regions of high importance. So in here, in green and in yellow, I can see three-dimensional volumes that are completely new defined structures uh, based on, on the explainability of the, of the method. So um, this has the potential of defining completely new structures that are important for the flow uh, and which eventually can maybe help us to uh, devise uh, better flow control strategies. Okay, so SHAP uh, explainability of deep learning to identify the regions of the flow that are most important or the most um, the most impactful coherent structures in my turbine channel. And then in my second part, I'm going to be talking about a flow control. So I'm gonna be trying to develop um, strategies through deep reinforcement learning. Uh, well, the reinforcement learning framework is reasonably simple. Uh, we have this schematic that you can see over here where I have an agent the ENT is our neural network, our machine learning model, and I have an environment. And the environment, in our case, is going to be a CFD simulation that contains the flow. And the agent needs to be interacting with the environment. 
that interaction can be done via actions. And those actions are going to be the flow control that we want to do. And then the environment is going to respond to the agent through a change in its state. And the state can be something that we know about the flow. And through it, uh, this R over here, which is a reward. So this reward is a measure of the quality of the actions under a certain norm. So we invent a particular norm, and that's going to be um, defining the reward of my system. So essentially, the goal of reinforcement learning is through trial and error to define a policy pie, which given the state of the system, it can provide us with a set of actions that will maximize the reward in the long term. That's what we want to do. So try, trying and interacting with the CFD simulation, the agent is going to uh, iteratively converge towards a control strategy, a policy that will give me a very well-performing control strategy. Now, this is work by Luca Wastoni and others. You have the reference here. Uh, in the work by Colin Vignon, uh, where you can also see the reference, uh, we have a very a complete review paper where you can see new methods of reinforcement learning, applications to flow control, and to a very wide range of areas within fluid mechanics. So this is the flow control problem that we're considering. We are going to look at a turbulent channel, in particular, a turbulent open channel flow. The reason for uh, using an open channel uh, is um, to have a slightly simpler dynamics of the larger scales. And we're going to be comparing with opposition control, opposition control, which was introduced by Choi and others in 1994. I'll be telling you more about opposition control in a minute. And we're going to consider two different turbulent channels, one minimal channel and one full channel. The minimal channel will allow us to um, basically simplify the dynamics of the near world region in such a way that hopefully we can more easily find good control strategies. And then we will deploy the control strategies learned in the minimal channel for the full channel. So we'll try to really have a, a more comprehensive view uh, when the full dynamics of the flow is present uh, in, the, um, in the domain. Okay. So <clears throat> opposition control relies on the following concept. I am uh, sensing a particular plane, uh, this YS. So I'm picking a plane, uh, a horizontal plane. Uh, typically, this plane is the near wall uh, region. So around Y plus 15, where I have the strongest fluctuations. And I am sensing the wall normal fluctuations in the near wall region at Y plus 15. And at the wall, so at the lower surface, what I'm going to do is impose a flow control that is opposing those fluctuations. So I have a constant alpha multiplied by minus one. Uh, this alpha is typically one in the classical opposition control. And it typically gives the best performance, by the way. So what I have is if in the near world region I have a positive wall normal fluctuation, at the wall I will impose a negative wall normal fluctuation of the same magnitude and vice versa. So I will, in a bit of a crude way, in a bit of a naive way, try to uh, kill the near world fluctuations with the hope of controlling and maybe laminarizing the flow. Okay? That's the idea of this uh, control strategy. Now, of course, the opposition control is a quite simple control. No, I mean, I'm just uh, hoping that I see a fluctuation, I oppose it, and I will kill it, and then things will be easier than that. But of course, um, turbulence is much more complex than just opposing things. It's highly nonlinear. There's complex, complex interscale interactions. Therefore, that approach might not be necessarily the, the best. Um, what we use is that we deploy a multi-agent reinforcement learning framework, MARL, which you can see here in this uh, slide. So what we do is we are going to be uh, dividing the domain into these, um, these blocks. I tessellate the domain. Uh, in this model, in this multi-agent approach, um, I have what is called pseudo environments. So in each of these squares, I have, um, well, basically a set of observations uh, with, a, with an agent that is actually um, learning to optimize uh, based on those observations, uh, but all those multi, all those pseudo environments are connected. So the, they all are updating the same neural network, the same agent, through the multiple observations that are being taken in each of those pseudo environments. So the idea is that all these agents are uh, working together uh, in such a way that one can globally optimize and get the maximum benefit um, through their uh, interactions. So if you optimize individually for each agent, 
each agent might be selfishly trying to get the best reward, uh, but the multi-agent is a better approach because all of them can start to collaborate. So we can really have different regions working together to find the, the most performing control strategies. Uh, our state will be at Y plus 15 in the region right above the, the pseudo environment that we're considering. And we are taking the stringwise and world normal velocity fluctuations at my state. The reward is the uh, drug reduction. In this case, because I have a turbulent channel, I'm going to be considering the world share stress. So one minus tau W over the uncontrolled tau W over the plane. Eh? That would be my reward. Uh, so the state and the reward are fed into the agent and the agent based on the policy that has been uh, trained, it will decide the action. And the action is a velocity at the wall. Right? So positive or negative with a particular amplitude, that will be my, my flow control section, right? The action decided by the, by the agent. So some more details of the setup that we have here for our uh, model, for our multi-agent reinforcement learning. We have a quite fast actuation interval. I'm act actuating every 0.6 viscous times. Uh, the actuation intensity is limited from minus u tau to plus u tau, just for the purpose of having a controlled bounded actuation. Um, as I mentioned, all actuators have the same policy. Yeah? So this is the essence of the model um, approach. And we are uh, learning the policy through DDPG. So a deep deterministic policy gradient, which is a model free of policy actor critic uh, approach. So basically I am um, uh, sampling from a space of distributions. And then when I'm uh, converged in terms of my actions, then I'm uh, running the algorithm in a deterministic way. Now uh, I'm using a thousand actuations per episode and uh, all the rest of parameters can be found in the reference. I will share with you the repository at the end. So all of these codes and the data are all of open access. So you can go into the repository, download the code and really uh, obtain the same results that we are obtaining. Um, in reinforcement learning, there are many parameters. So it's important to be able to reproduce the same setup exactly. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the results. Um, First, we run this in a minimal channel, and uh, you can see here the uh, drug reduction as a function of time eh, in a particular uh, episode. This is an average over episodes. Uh, for the opposition control, we get around 26% drug reduction, whereas uh, the reinforcement learning gives us 43% drug reduction. So we can significantly outperform the uh, drug reduction of the classical method. Eh? We can get much better drug reduction rates. Uh, for the set of actuation that I mentioned, eh, if one increase the, the power of the actuator, probably we would get even more drug reduction, but uh, this is already quite good. And if I take the same policy that was learned in a minimal channel and I deploy it in a full channel, um, the opposition control achieves only 20% drug reduction and the DRL 30%. So instead of 40 something, I obtain 30% but I still significantly outperform the classical solution. So uh, of course there's uh, room for improvement, but at the same time there is tremendous potential uh, to really achieve even more, um, more pronounced uh, drug reduction rates with this strategy, okay? <clears throat> and even more interestingly, because to me, I mean, the drug reduction is good and that's something that one can uh, try to study more. But I think the most interesting thing is to analyze the control flow, to really see what's happening with the control flow and what type of strategy is being discovered by the reinforcement learning agent. So if I look at uh, the quadrant analysis, to close the circle and go back to what I started the presentation with, uh, on the top, I'm showing you the no control um, flow, basically where in the horizontal axis, I'm showing you the stringwise velocity fluctuations at y plus 15, and in the vertical axis, the wall normal velocity fluctuations at y plus 15. If one does the quadrant analysis, as I mentioned, the Q2, which is the top left, and the Q4, which is the bottom right corners, are the dominant ones in turbulence. And that's what the uncontrolled flow reflects. I mean, clearly, uh, I have a dominance of uh, ejections and sweeps um, in my uh, baseline case. And with the position control, which is the second um, panel, what I see is um, the fact that the control is trying to shrink those fluctuations, but the topology of the, of the quadrant analysis is very similar. I mean, Q2 and Q4 are still dominant. So the flow is not dramatically different from the original one when I apply a position control. 
But if one looks at the third panel, which is the quadrant analysis for the DRL-based control, one sees something very remarkable. First thing is uh, the topology of the quadrant analysis has completely changed. Uh, and second, the predominance of the Q2s and Q4s, so the predominance in the joint probability density function of the top left and bottom right corners is gone. You can see these darker regions over here. These do not really uh, give me a predominance of Q2s and Q4s. So the flow is fundamentally different with the DRL control, which is pretty interesting because that gives us the idea, that gives us the indication that we can uh, really come up with completely novel flow control strategies and completely new uh, flows uh, where the energy transfer mechanisms are significantly affected and potentially even um, with quite novel physics uh, that one can try to, to understand in this, in this context. So we're currently looking at this. We're increasing the Reynolds number. I'm trying to look at boundary layers, uh, but this is in principle quite, quite promising, I think. Okay, and that's uh, everything that I wanted to uh, talk about uh, today. I talked to you about the SHAP framework from explainable artificial intelligence to study and identify coherent structures in world boundary turbulence. I uh, gave you possibilities for modeling the flow and more importantly, for controlling the flow. So deep reinforcement learning uh, gives me a significant uh, potential for drug reduction in a full channel, 30% um, drug reduction um, compared to only 20% from the opposition control. Uh, this is my contact information. So my email, my, the web of my lab. Uh, in uh, YouTube, we have many videos where we discuss many of our articles. So you can really see more details there. Uh, and also in this QR code, you can access our GitHub repository. So all the codes of everything that I talked about today uh, are available here. And of course, you can always reach out to collaborate and, and try to see ideas together. Or if you want to uh, discuss codes, we can always do that as well. For now, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That was an excellent talk and your QR code works. I tried it with my phone. So cool. you can keep the link and uh, check it out uh, later. We have any questions for Ricardo on that uh, machine learning and turbulence talk? So I, I had a question for you, Ricardo. Um, yep. Is the ultimate goal of this, besides obviously the understanding and coming up with attention loop control strategies, can this type of framework be actually deployed in the field on in a, in a flow device or something where you're sensing and controlling in real time, or is it just simply an academic exercise to get more insight and new ideas? What yeah, that's an excellent. That at all? That's an excellent question. I mean, of course, we can get new ideas through this type of analysis. I mean, understanding how the control flow looks like can help us to learn something about the physics, but the ultimate goal is to implement this experimentally. So we are uh, working also with experimentalists to do this in real time uh, yeah. in, in the wind tunnel. So that's that's the idea. The good thing is that the DRL, the reinforcement learning, uh, once it's trained, the evaluation is uh, immediate. There is, there is a little bit of latency and one needs to be careful with the acquisition and the signal processing. But uh, there's some uh, some people who have done these things in a wind tunnel, and I mean, it seems to be not a problem at all, the, the latency of the DRL evaluation. So it seems to be quite promising. And uh, yeah, and we want to deploy this also in real wind tunnels. We are extending this to, to other flow cases, like uh, a 2D and 3D cylinders, relevant air convection. Uh, we are doing a 3D separation bubble that we're controlling also with DRL. So it seems to be quite promising in many, many different flow cases. Great. Okay, any other questions for Ricardo? Okay, Ricardo, thank you so much. I hope everything goes well with you and your family, and uh, we'll be in touch and appreciate you signing in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure, and we stay in touch. Welcome. Okay.